Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, May 13th. I'm one of your co-moderators, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. Our show topic today is Connecting Your Students with the World, Tools and Projects to Make Global Collaboration Come Alive, K-8. to We have three special guests today. Paula Noggle, Billy Krakauer, and Jerry Blumengarten, if Jerry gets into this session. I'm going to turn the mic over to Susie Higley, who will introduce our special guests and ask the newbie question. Good morning, everybody. I have been looking forward to this for so long to have these three outstanding educators all in one webinar. It is just so exciting to be able to learn from them today. We have Billy Krakauer, who is a computer technology instructor, gifted and talented STEAM teacher for grades three and four, is also a co-teacher for ELA for special ed students in the Woodland Park Public School District in New Jersey. He served as a special ed teacher in the inclusion setting a resource room. He's a co-author of four books in addition to the one we're going to hear about today. And Paula Noggle, 42 years of education. Oh my goodness. And she is the fabulous example. Uh, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, those old teachers, they just keep teaching the same way. Paula constantly renews what she does and does so many things for her students and has taught all of us too. She teaches fourth graders ELA and social studies in a public school just outside of the city. And she's definitely preparing her students for their futures as a 21st century digital citizenship. She's a Discovery Education Star, member of the DEN Leadership Council, a Microsoft Innovative Educator, one of the uh, organizers for Ed Camp New Orleans, and she's one of our hosts for Classroom 2.0. And then Jerry Blumengarten, you can, you can hardly ever be in a Twitter chat without having Jerry share entire list of resources that fit whatever you need. He does participate especially in things like Ed Chat, English Social Studies Chat, Sat Chat, Fourth Chat, many more. And I can always recall when he came to ISTE, he was like the rock star of ISTE and everybody had to have their picture taken with Jerry. So we are so fortunate to have them with us today. And let's ask them the newbie question. Why is it important for students to connect with other students around the world? Well, good morning, everyone. It has been a challenging week for me with my internet connection problems at home. So currently, I'm sitting in a coffee shop because I didn't want a chance getting bumped out of the webinar. So anyhow, welcome. Um, our, my co-host, Billy Krakauer from New Jersey, made it in. But unfortunately, we are missing Jerry right now. He is having connection problems in Florida. So um, <clears throat> it is important for our students to connect with other students around the world because of um, the digital citizenship standards that need to be met and the ISTE standards that need to be met for students, and because that's what our world's about today. If Jerry had been here, he was going to start us out with our story of how a certain group of educators got connected so that we could connect our students. Okay, so this is what he was going to share. Once upon a time, over five years ago in the land of Twitter, there was a chat mainly for fourth grade educators called Fourth Chat. Each Monday, passionate educators would join together to share and talk about how to best facilitate the learning of their students. We started by doing mystery location calls, which brought together classes in different locations. Each class had to figure out where the other class was located. To continue the discussion on fourth chat, a group decided to meet, to meet each Sunday evening on a Google Hangout. The first one we did was on September 13th of 2012. The group represented seven states. Nancy Carroll from Massachusetts, Jessica Baumgartner, who is now Jessica Stiers from Pennsylvania, Jennifer Ragroot from Indiana, Dan Caruso from New Jersey, Billy Krakauer from New Jersey, myself from Louisiana, 
Jerry from Florida, and Kim Powell from Michigan. Um, we would connect every Sunday evening and we would decide um, after we had done our mystery location calls what were other ways that we could connect our classes. So we, could, we made plans and we made um, arrangements to connect with each other in every way that we could. And as a result of us doing this for over two years, um, it led to the writing of the book that um, Jerry, Billy, and I did. And we accomplished writing that book by doing it on Google Docs and through Google Hangouts. <clears throat> Jerry's main contribu contributions were ways to celebrate events and happenings every month on his wonderful website. If you want to know about just about anything, there is a page for that. And Jerry so willingly shares and is currently updating his website with his over 793 pages of stuff he's been going through right now and um, updating all of his links. So let's move forward. Okay. So the, our book was called Connecting Your Students to the World and it dealt with projects for the K to 8th grade. And as I said, my slides, okay. We just talked about why we wrote it. We wanted to share our experiences with others and give them some easy step-by-step -step guidelines to help them also get started with making global collaborations. And as we said, we started out kind of simply with mystery location calls, or as they were originally known, mystery Skype, and worked on virtual field trips. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some fall projects and I'm going to ask Billy to jump in too when he's ready. Okay, so our fall projects that are so much fun to do are um, International Dot Day. This one happens around, I love it, it's a, um, based on the book by Peter Reynolds called The Dot, and International Dot Day happens around September 15th-ish, as he likes to say because sometimes September 15th falls on the weekend. So what happens there is that you do a read aloud of the dot in your classroom. There is a website that is um, in the five binders, plus if you just do International Dot Day, you'll get to it, um, where lots of teachers from all over the world sign up their classes to participate. It's kind of up to you how you want to connect with other classes. I've done several hangouts where we have, my students have ended up making their dot for dot day and then we have shared our dot with other classes through a Google hangout. I'm sorry. Um, another one is uh, if you teach where there are a lot of Hispanic students, another great one to do is Hispanic Heritage Month um, to really celebrate cultural differences that are going on. The OREO, the O-R-E-O, -E which stands for our really online, our, wait, I got it wrong, our really exciting online project is one sponsored by Jen Wagner from California, and it involves stacking Oreo cookies. Who doesn't love Oreo cookies, right? And um, basically she runs a um, website where you do the stacking, you get a class average, and then you post your results there. Well, that was fun for years. She's done this project for over 17 years. But as more tools became available to educators, she decided to let those of us who like doing the Oreo project figure out ways to collaborate with each other. So what I've done is each year now that when we do the Oreo project, we not only do the stacking within our classroom, we get on a Google Hangout and we do a stacking competition with another class. And we also play Kahoot game, which I'll talk more about later, um, virtual, I mean, a competitive Kahoot. Another awesome collaborative project that um, you should be involved in, your school should check out, is a global read aloud. This is run by Purnell Rip from Wisconsin. She has already picked the books for the upcoming year, so if you want to check it out and get ready over the summer so that your students can participate in global read aloud, 
I would strongly suggest you do that. Um, Thanksgiving, it's interesting to see the difference between the Thanksgiving celebration in Canada and the United States. I live in the central time zone, so it's easy for me to connect with classes that are in the central time zone from Canada down through Central America, and I love, love to do that. All right, I think I'm going to stop, and let's see if Billy wants to talk and sing about I'm just gonna, some of these. All right, before we go on, I wanted to go back and talk about the um, starting out. It's always the question, and that's kind of how we came to write the book, is that how do you start out? How do you connect your classrooms to the outside world? And one way that we found was the easiest was to do either a mystery location call or a mystery Skype call. And if you look now, you'll notice that mystery location calls and mystery Skype calls are very uh, popular. And a lot of people have been doing it across the world. Their mystery Skype has their own website now. None of that existed back when we wrote the book a couple of years ago. And it's just a simple, easy project in order to connect your students. And it's one class going against another class, trying to figure out where that class is located. And in the chapter we wrote, we actually give you a guide on different roles students can play, different themes you can do with the students, different ways just to get started in doing this simple project that we believe is the best way to get that first connection. It's also teaching skills to students that are important, such as collaborating, communicating, connecting with one another, valuable skills that they need in the 21st century. And also virtual field trips. If you don't want to start out with connecting another classroom, you can start off with a simple virtual field trip where you're connecting to a different location. And I'll go into it a little bit later, but one simple project was I went with uh, Nancy Carroll, went to Plymouth Plantation, and she Skyped from there with her cell phone, and my students were able to experience that. I also then brought her with me when we went to Ellis Island. So we were sharing different field trips that students may not necessarily get to do. There's a ton of virtual field trips. Now Google offers a expedition. Google offers Google Cardboard. There's so many different ways to take students outside of the classroom walls while staying inside the classroom walls. And I'm going to go back and continue our fall projects. And one of the projects, Paul, I don't know if you remember this one, but the we did a weather affects us, and it was myself, uh, Paula from New Orleans, our friend Jen from Indiana, Nancy from Massachusetts, and I believe we had someone from California, and we would just compare for six weeks a different type of weather. We used Edmodo, and we were just connecting back and forth in a simple project just to see the difference in the weather patterns in different parts of the United States. I mentioned Plymouth Plantation. We were studying it for the pilgrims. Nancy Carroll happened to live up in Massachusetts and went to Plymouth Plantation. So she was able to go there and be there with us. And I'll never forget the expression on one of the people's faces when Nancy was holding the phone. And one of my kids asked the question, and they're sitting in character, trying to stay in character and keep the straightest face when a voice is coming out of the cell phone. The Gettysburg Address was um, something we did, a reading of the Gettysburg Address, and just discussed it on November 19th. So that's a simple little to-do project. Uh, a couple of winter projects, and I'm going to let Paula handle the random acts of kindness, Christmas kindness, but I'm going to talk about the Holiday Card Exchange, which is another project by Jen. And it's where you get 29 different schools that you get to send a card to, and you can see from the picture they're from all across the United States and even Canada. My students love doing it. Being a computer teacher, I had my students do it on Publisher, and we received handmade cards. It was a wonderful, simple to do project. And I see a question, Jen. His last name is Jen Ragruth. So for those who are looking for a last name, Paula, do you want to talk about Random Acts of Kindness? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to just add also, I don't know if you remember this, Billy, but one time when we were connected, um, we had, I don't remember which project we were doing, but you you were about to be dismissed from school because you were getting a half day off because of the, the snow that was happening in New Jersey. So I remember you taking your webcam over to the window and showing my students in southeast Louisiana how much snow that there was going on outside the classroom. And my kids, of course, loved it because 
My 10-year-olds at that point had not seen snow in their life unless they'd traveled somewhere else. All right, with random acts of Christmas kindness, random acts of kindness can happen all year, but uh, for December I like to do the RAC activity, which is random acts of Christmas kindness. And all it is is just a simple way to, um, you know, reach out to others and say thank you, you hold the door open. So my kids um, write about different things that they do to be kind to others, and we share it out with other people through either an Inmodo or a Google Doc or any other collaborative way that you find. It could be done on a Padlet. I mean, there are so many different web tools. So we're, you know, we're about making the connections and doing the sharing. And you give, you know, you have choices to make as to how you want to do it. Um, um, the random acts of kindness, I get, have little things I can give out to the kids where they can, you know, maybe leave a peppermint on one of their favorite teacher's desk, and it has a little tag that's attached to it, you've just been racked. Uh, one year, I took them all, um, I went to the dollar store and bought candy canes, and we went out in the parking lot, and we left a candy cane on every uh, teacher's classroom out in the parking lot, so it's a nice little treat for them to go to. Um, it could be just making a card or whatever, just to, you know, be in the holiday spirit um, and to have a nice way to celebrate. All right, moving on to... Okay, other winter projects that we've done. I know that um, Nancy and Billy did the regular Super Bowl, and Billy and Nancy and I also... Um, when you did the Super Bowl, S-O-U-P-E-R, there is an online community that um, encourages you during the month of January leading up to the Super Bowl to have um, a, uh, either a class or a school collection of soup and then to contribute it to your nearest um, charitable organization in your community. So my students and I did that. We um, had a little competition going on to see which class could beat the other class. And it was fun to do, and it was easy. Uh, probably the hardest thing was the, you know, make, making arrangements for the pickup or the delivery of the soup. But it was, it was really great to see the participation by the students, making the graphs of how many different soups we brought in, things like that. And then you, know, you can bring in so many different standards while you're doing these collaborative projects. And as we did our book, we did link to all of the um, Common Core standards and the ISTE standards and the Next Science Generation standards. Any standard that we felt the project tapped in on, we included it. Um, another winter project is Read Across America. And our little group, for several years, has been able to get Jerry to be one of our readers in our classroom. So Jerry will get on Google Hangout, we'll all join in, and Jerry will read one of the Dr. Seuss books to us um, and give the, the kids some background because he and his wife actually lived across the street, I believe, is how it went. Billy, I might be uh, amiss in what the connection is, but he has an actual Dr. Seuss connection. Um, I don't do much with the 100th day of school because I don't teach math. Billy, do you do that one? No, I don't do the 100th day one, but I was going to say for uh, both the Super Bowl and the Read Across America, um, Jerry's wife was from Springfield, Massachusetts, where Dr. Seuss was also born. So that was his connection with the Dr. Seuss one. And if you remember, we've done it with, we've had six, seven different uh, schools across the country when we've done the um, hangout. And also the Super Bowl story. So myself and Nancy Carroll were doing the first mystery location call and uh, it turned out it was the Monday after the Patriots and the Giants both made it into the Super Bowl and my school <laughs> happened to be about 15 minutes from Giant Stadium at that point in time when Giant Stadium was still in existence and Nancy's school happened to be across the street from Gillette Stadium so uh, we had a little fun with that and we had our students do the research on Indianapolis about the different items that they could find, different thoughts that they know about Indianapolis, and we had a little uh, bet going up whichever team won. The other team had to hang a picture or banner in their uh, school all day, so that was a little fun with the um, Super Bowl. 
I know the 100th day of school, I believe that's another Jen Wagner project, uh, different little projects for um, students to do. And moving on to the next one, Martin's Big Words was um, a project I've done a read aloud about civil rights movements with our fourth grade and we connected with the sixth grade class. So we're able to talk about that. Uh, Mardi Gras is a project I love when uh, Paula does it every year, when she does do it. And we've learned the different culture of what goes on in Mardi Gras. I don't know if Paula, you want to share any more about that? Yes, it's, it, this is a fun project for my students to do. Um, Mardi Gras, of course, we get an actual week off of school before Mardi Gras celebration because um, if you're not familiar with the Mardi Gras celebration, most people think of Mardi Gras as a one-day activity. Well, Mardi Gras actually starts on um, January 6th and runs through um, Fat Tuesday, which is the day before the Lenten season begins. So it can go on for weeks, and there are parades most nights of the week, and there are lots of crews, which is spelled K-R-E-W-E, um, that put on the parades. And it's sometimes referred to as um, the greatest free show on earth, because when you go to a parade, I'll never forget, I was born in New York and raised in Pennsylvania. And when I attended the parade, I was a participant as far as just watching the parade go by, right? Well, the first Mardi Gras parade I went to, they started throwing things at me. And I was like, what is this all about? So my students love to share um, all of their favorite catches and things that they get. There is one parade called Zulu. And I've gone to the Zulu parade for years, and I've never gotten the coveted Zulu coconut. But in this picture, the young girl sitting in front of the webcam is sharing on a Google Hangout. And I'm not sure how many people were in this one particular Google Hangout. But she's sharing her um, Zulu coconut with the other classes. And we end up by doing, um, putting on some Mardi Gras music and doing what's called the second line dance. Um, which goes on after the parade, like some of the people will actually join in the parade. So my students do some research about Mardi Gras, they learn the history of it, they learn about the different crews, the cost, the amount of trash <laughs> that's um, created so that it can cover math, it can, they write about um, their favorite um, activity for Mardi Gras, family events, and so there's lots of different ways that they can share. We share through, they make Google slide presentations, which they can share during the Google Hangouts with other students. So what I do is we get it all going, do our research, and then on Twitter, I will create a Google Doc of times that my students can present to other classrooms. And if you know, if you've done Google Hangouts, you can have up to, other, uh, up to 10 other groups join you. So I will tweet out the Google Doc saying, these are our available times. Please sign up and let us know if you'd like to join in. So this year, over, I think, a three-day period, my students presented to about 15 different classrooms in the United States and Canada. And of course, one of their favorite parts is at the end when you do the Q&A, they love being able to answer the questions. Um, that the other students ask. I'm sorry if you're hearing that noise in the background. Okay, they're making ice drinks here at the coffee shop. But um, this is one of the ones. Some years I, I can do it. Some years the way it falls and with testing preparation and stuff, it's been not able to do it, but I was able to this year, and it's always great. Okay, moving on. Oh, and one of the other things I wanted to say about that, um, there's a teacher that, um, I don't know if Louise has actually ever presented for us, but her name is Louise Morgan in San Antonio, Texas. And after she was one of the teachers that came in and watched our Mardi Gras presentation, she decided to have her second graders do the spring fiesta the same way. So my fourth graders got to later on in that same school year join a Google Hangout and watch her second graders teach us about the Spring Fiesta in San Antonio. Um, for spring projects, one of my favorites as an ELA teacher is Poetry Month, which occurs during the month of April. 
Um, there's lots of ways you can do that. You can do poetry recitals. You can do choral poetry reading. Um, a buddy of mine, um, Jan Wells in Kansas, and I did the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere as a choral reading where my students would read one stanza, her students would read another stanza back and forth on a Skype call um, one time. From that Skype call, we decided to go ahead and make a, um, just, saw, just lost the word. Uh, gosh, what was, oh, voice thread. We made a voice thread. So her students did um, pictures, and my students did pictures that went with the stanzas we read. So if you're familiar with voice threads, you can upload a picture and then you can do a recording over the picture and it puts it together. And people can listen to your voice thread and add comments. So as you listen to the voice thread, um, you know, our students took turns adding their voice over, to, over the pictures and we ended up getting lots and lots of different comments on that particular one. Um, one that my students have also done during Poetry Month is they make a, um, I call it, the project is My Poem Gallery. And thanks to the wonderfulness of Google, if you do a Google slideshow and you share out the Google slideshow with others, um, you can have comments left. So they make their slideshow with the different poems that they've created during the month of April and I share them out. And because of Twitter, anytime you share activities by your students and you want comments, always remember to use the hashtag comments for kids, meaning the number four in the middle. So the hashtag comments for kids will end up getting you lots and lots of global comments from teachers around the world who follow that hashtag. Billy and I have both uh, participated in the Picture It project, which is another Jen Wagner project. I'm going to let him talk about that in a minute. I'm going to talk about the Impromptu Calls, which was a project that was born out of fourth chat. I'm sure all of us that are um, classroom teachers in the United States where major state testing occurs, understand what happens after state testing happens. You kind of go into that lull, lull period, but you've still got school, but it's like, who? You know, we got through all the bulk of what we needed to do, but we still have several weeks of school left. So to keep it interesting, we decided that I would create a Google Doc, and anybody who signed up on the Google Doc was agreeing to be available for an impromptu call. That meant there was no time set up. When you're on Skype, and if you keep Skype open in your classroom, anyone you're connected to, will um, their name will pop up on your interactive whiteboard, and they'll say, so-and-so is online. And what I would do is I would just click on that if they were on the, the dock, and I'd say, and it would, you know, put the Skype call through for, to them. And we would have an impromptu Skype call. We would just talk about whatever we were doing at that particular moment, or just let the kids chat to each other. And a funny story, the first year I did this, again, I connected with my buddy uh, Jen Wells in Kansas, and the first impromptu call that she took, the camera came on, and instead of seeing her class full of kids, we saw a classroom full of teachers. And I went, oh, Jan, I'm sorry, what am I doing? She goes, no, this is perfect. She, she knew that, you know, she had signed up for the, the call. She said, I happen to be presenting about the power of doing Skype calls to other teachers today on a PD day. So she goes, this is perfect. We did not have a plan. My students had made Earth Day posters and bumper stickers that we were going to share with her kids during the impromptu call. So instead, we spent 20 minutes doing it with teachers at her uh, PD day. Earth Day is another great one for the um, uh, collection and for our connections and collaborations. I participated in the grocery bag project for years 
we would go next door to our grocery store, get 400 brown paper bag groceries, because that's how they're bundled, uh, decorate them, return them to the grocery store uh, with messages about, um, you know, protecting Mother Earth. And then the 10-day pa uh, passion challenge is one that I ran for a couple of years where anybody that signed up on Google Doc, um, our kids would spend 10 days sharing their passion. Some people call it genius hour. Um, some people call it 20% time, whatever you, you refer to it as. So, Billy, I'm going to let you talk more about the picture of project. I'm um, going to skip the picture project because honestly, Paul, I don't remember what we did with the picture project. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. And go on to because I'm also looking at the time and time is getting up on us. So a couple of other spring projects you can do is baseball, one of my favorite sports to watch and talk about with my students. And you can compare the different stadiums, the different dimensions. It's a great math project to see that not all baseball stadiums are the exact same size and where the diamond and the field is the same, the outfields are not the same and the exceeding capacity, the stats, there's so much you can do with that. Another project that I uh, like to do and Jerry loves too is the Holocaust Remembrance Day is just to try and um, either virtually visit the Holocaust museums or the where the concentration camps were or if you're even as lucky enough to find a survivor and have them Skype with your classroom is another simple and easy to do project to do with your students. A couple other projects um, for summer, uh, for those of us who are still in school in June, is talking about Flag Day on June 14th, uh, discussing your favorite books to read over the summer, and the blogging challenges which is just a fun way to get your kids to write during the summer, have them give them different challenges to do. And one of my favorite aspects of uh, all these projects, and Paula has been involved in the one on the left-hand side, is sharing a guest speaker. And um, the picture on the left is uh, Dr. Salemi, who is, was a parent of mine, uh, Board of Education member as well, and he's a veterinarian, and he used to come in a couple times a year and share with the kids what he is doing, what he does. And in that one, he was talking about the different animals that he brings in and he works with. And my students were highly engaged, and you could see in the background there, I think, Paula, that might actually have been your class or Nancy Carroll's class in that picture. And the kids were able to interact, ask different questions, and just learn what he does. On the right is another guest speaker, and I'm not sure if that's from you, Paula, or somebody else, but just bringing in a different speaker, and I will share one project I did back two years ago with the hour of coding, the week of coding. I was able to connect with someone from San Francisco, California. I don't know if it was San Francisco or somewhere on the West Coast who worked for Microsoft and designed Xbox games. And my students loved learning that if they learn coding, they can learn how to design their own games. So that's just different other projects you can do with your students. And I know Paula is going to talk about this when she's, she spoke with an author. Yeah, uh, one of the ways that I love to connect is anytime I can find an author to connect with um, my class with. Um, Jeff Rivera and I connected a couple of years ago during the month of October when they were doing an anti-bullying campaign. Um, and um, he was connected somehow to the Nickelodeon group, and he had different people that would actually Skype into the classroom and talk to the kids. So I signed up again because I was on Twitter. I saw a tweet about it, and I signed up and did that. So that's how I first met Jeff. And Jeff is also an, a book author. So when he his book was coming out live, he was looking for people to um, Skype into their classroom, read the book with him, and then have a um, discussion. So that's a picture of it going on. Uh, I'm sorry. That's a picture of a tweet between Jeff and I. Um, went back and forth. And the, the, 
picture on the right is Amy Shaw from the Pika Pack website. Pika Pack is a social emotional learning site that is um, book based. They write books about the different um, aspects that um, we need to share with students, such as confidence and perseverance and things like that. So we were having a Google Hangout with them this year, discussing the books and the characters. Um, it's a fairly new platform, and I was one of the classrooms kind of checking it out from them. So um, Amy and I and Angie had done several Google Hangouts on the weekend discussing what was going on. And I said, you know, this is great, but wouldn't you like to hear from my kids? And they went, yeah, can we do that? I said, yeah, they'd love to talk to you about this whole project. So we set it up one day, and um, they came away with some amazing insights from the kids' thoughts on the, the, um, the book, the characters, the activities that are part of the Pika Pack project. So they've had a little input into helping um, structure and strengthen an online site, which is just thrilling to them. Uh, um, if you are a connected educator, it becomes easier to get your kids connected. And that's one of the things that the three of us stress anytime we talk at conferences around the world or share on Twitter or do hangout. We are always talking about how important it is to be a connected educator so that you can connect your students. Billy, do you want to talk about the Winter Olympics and the, the quiz that we did? Because remember, I had to do that from home that day. We didn't. Or no, I was no. at school. I think I was the only one at school, right? Yeah, so we did um, well, back in days. 2014. They, we decided to do a fun activity for the Winter Olympics. And what happened was we were all scheduled to do it right before the Olympics started. And um, it snowed. We had a major northeastern Easter. And, um, Paula was the only one in, and a couple of us did it at home with our students, and then wound up connecting anyways, where we were able to ask each other questions about the Olympics, the different events that were going on, and we added a little bit to it where we had students giving live updates from the Winter Olympics of the events that were going on. The students truly enjoyed it, and I actually want to share another story during that time as well. Our friend, um, Jen Ragrath, actually was able to connect with a couple of the Olympians in the village. Um, we're able to Skype in and connect. So coming up, you know, next winter, the 2018 Olympics, you know, one of those things you can do is look for signing up to connect with the Olympians and in the village. It's a great way for the students to learn, to grow, and just to get some ideas. And it's simple to do little project or it's trivia questions and they're talking and learning. And then you have any time projects. We've talked about mystery location calls. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to get students just to learn, to grow. You're talking social studies. You're talking communication skills. Virtual debates um, was another easy to do topic. Uh, my friends in the middle school, in, uh, South Orange Middle School, when um, they were working there, my friend Alyssa Malaspina and Melissa Butler used to do these virtual debates where they would go against other middle schools, and one was on homework, one was on the cell phones, why they should, why they shouldn't have it in the school, and they had to draw which side they would, and no matter what side they had to defend their reasons, they would have judges. So it's something simple to do with your students, and it can be done at any age. Paula, I know you've been waiting to talk about competitive cahoots, so I will let you go on that one. All right, competitive cahoots are not included in our book because this is something that is a fairly new activity um, since our book came out, so it'll have to go in the updated version. Um, if you're familiar with cahoots, um, it is a game-based uh, question game that you can play on any device. And for a long time, it just had um, single players. You know, each, each kid would log in on whatever device they were on. Now, now Kahoot, actually I started doing competitive Kahoot's before they had the group thing because I would just have the kids share 
uh, a Chromebook and just take turns answering. But now that they have the group mode on Kahoot, it's even more fun to do it. So what we do is I connect with a couple other classes around the country and say, hey, who wants to do a competitive Kahoot about, you know, just a general social studies topic or a general math topic or uh, a general English topic such as figurative language. None of the kids have seen the Kahoot before, so they're all the questions are going to be new to everybody in the Kahoot. And whoever runs the Google Hangout for the competitive Kahoot shares their screen, runs the Kahoot game on their screen if the, uh, the kids are logged in. And if you're familiar with Kahoot, there's always a leaderboard that can be displayed after each question. So we have the kids log in with Novel Team 1, Rag Group Team 2, you know, whatever. Uh, we did it with one class. He only had two devices, so he was filling their boys and filling their girls. Um, but it was so much fun to, to do this. Uh, we, the first time I ever did it, I did it after a, um, we were doing the Oreo stacking problem, um, competition, and I said, wait. I have some a little extra activity to do after the competitive stacking. I want to try this out, and I want to see if all of us can play a Kahoot game together. So that was the first time I had ever done it, and it was so great. There is an actual Kahoot game about the flavors of Oreo cookies. I did not know that there were over 15 flavors of Oreo cookies. So what it does is it shows you a picture of the Oreo cookie, and you have to guess which flavor it is. So it was fun to play. It wasn't real um, learning oriented, but it was fun, and I just wanted to see how it worked through the Google Hangout. And when I realized I could do this, it took off. So now we do virtual, I mean, competitive cahoots through Google Hangouts for lots of different things. And I get asked a lot on Twitter, hey, when can we do another competitive cahoot? So it's something to check out and think about. And um, as far as the virtual debate, I mean, my students have never done a debate, but what we did um, that was kind of similar is we connected with a seventh grade class here in New Orleans that were, um, they wanted some feedback on projects they had done about a global problem. They, had, they were in teams and they all researched a global um, project. And they had to uh, create a logo for it. Um, um, oh, what's, what's the other word? Oh, they put together a website for it. They had a, like an elevator pitch about it. And so they would present all of that to my students. And then my students would offer them feedback. And I, I had to laugh because the teacher kept in touch with me. And she said, We've done it. We did that with several other students, with sixth and seventh graders. And she said, your fourth graders gave them the best feedback. So that made me pretty proud of my kids. All right. So let's see. All right. So um, thanks to all of you who have joined us. If you are interested, if we're not about, you know, promoting our book, but we do like to promote our book, so if you would be interested in um, getting a copy of our book, you, Billy has given us a discount code, and um, Billy, would you explain to them how the e resources work? <laughs> if you just go to that website, all of our resources from the book are there. Also, the discount code is only good through the Rutledge website where you can save 20% on the discount. Um, so feel free to get it. It's also available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble as well. The resources though will be updated hopefully over the summer as the new ISTU standards just came out recently. We are working on updating all of that and that will also be available on the e-resources. and then our contact information. So you can either reach out to us via our email, our website, or feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. We'll be more than happy to answer any questions, any projects you might be having trouble with. And we're always available. Um, I would say this, Sherry's probably the easiest person to reach out to. He will get a web page back to you within probably five or 10 minutes if you ask him a question on something you're looking for.
So, Lori, did you capture any questions that we did not answer as we were going through the webinar? I did. Only a couple, though, Paula. So let me go back. You said something about following up on a mystery Skype. What sorts of ways do you do that? Somebody suggested Flipgrid. Is that something you use, or is it something else? Flipgrid is a good program. It's new. Um, a lot of this is coming out newer now. Mm -hmm. Mystery Skype has been around for at least five, six years, and people keep adding to it. So any way you want to connect any programs, technology is always changing. Sure. There's always new ideas, new projects, new programs that you can use to continue that connection. Our main philosophy is just to make sure you continue the conversation after, continue the connection. It shouldn't just be a one-time thing. You should try and connect with a class that you've connected with multiple times throughout the year. It's just a good way the kids get to meet one another, they get to grow, they get to learn from each other. Yes, okay. Uh, the thing, other question, another, I'm sorry, Paula, go oh, ahead. Another thing, another way to, once you've done a mystery location call, is to expand it on it by doing a, if you're a math teacher, a mystery number call. And what that in, it involves is you decide whether, you know, depending on the age of your student, how many digits are going to be in your number. Then the kids create clues going from more broad clues down to more specific clues that they give the other class until they zero in on the mystery number. I know that science classes do mystery elements where they give clues about the periodic chart, uh, mystery sciences, mystery famous people, mystery books. So there's lots of different ways. Making a mystery something call is a great way to get your kids connected to another classroom, and then talk to their teacher and figure out what's another thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Billy already answered this question. Have you used Connected Classroom yet, Paula? Um, are you talking about the Google Plus community? I'm not sure that Trish Type connected classroom. Have you used that? And there are several um, Google Plus communities I'm involved with. Mm -hmm. I am on the Skype in the classroom um, website as a teacher to contact. And but I'm not going to lie, most of my connections are made through Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. That's not where I find the easiest way to make my connections. And yes, this was Google Plus. And I think the my, other question my entry into all of sorry, my entry into all of this was through my one of my mentors, Jen Wagner, and her mm -hmm. projects by Jen. I started doing those projects back in two thousand four. Um, remember trying to do a Skype call for the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address where we were going to all try to do a choral reading of it. I couldn't get Skype to work. I couldn't join the group. I couldn't do anything right. So my kids ended up, I ended up setting up Skype in two classrooms side by side. Sure. And I put half my kids in one room and half my kids <laughs> in the other. And we just Skyped with each other. Well, that works <laughs> too. Make it work. certainly a, a good way to get the students uh, used to the process. And it's certainly a, a unique way to troubleshoot the, the technology issue. And technology always has a way to sometimes not work when, when you're expecting it to. Uh, thanks so much, Paula and Billy. Those were the questions that I was able to capture that hadn't been answered. And if anybody else has any questions, you can type in the chat. And we'll go ahead and ask. I see one uh, that Maureen um, was asking, how often do we do these Correct. projects? Once a month, once a term, once a week? Um, that's going to be depending on your level of comfort. And I just want to say bye to Billy because his mom showed up early. Billy, mm -hmm. I understand if you have to run, tell mom hi for me. And I can't wait to see you in um, New Jersey one of these days soon. 
Um, but anyhow, as far as how often do you do them, when I started this, I only connected with one class, and that class was mm -hmm. Jim Wells in Kansas. And we mm -hmm. made um, a very committed um, a commitment to each other that we were going to do a project, a collaborative project, once a month. So for that entire school year, which happened to be, the, I think it was the 2009-2010 school year, she and I would collaborate um, via email or calling each other or however we decided once a month and we decided what project we were going to do collaboratively. So we did one a month for that first year. Then the next year I started reaching out and connecting with more people and so did mm -hmm. she. And then it just mushrooms, mushrooms from there. Um, when you do your first ones, your kids will get hooked. I promise you if you do a Google Hangout or a Skype call one time in your classroom, your kids will be begging for more. Um, one of the things I always tell students is every year when I go back into my classroom and I reconnect my board and my computer and all of my tech, my first Skype or Google Hangout every year is with the classroom across the hall for me to make sure that my stuff works <laughs> properly. So I can run back and forth and troubleshoot, oh, the, the camera's not in focus, oh, the mic's not working, right. blah, 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 blah. And then I know I'm good to go for, you know, I'm set up properly to reach out and connect with others. Probably the biggest thing, my biggest pitfall that I've ever had is, you know, we've gotten caught in a severe thunderstorm where it just blew out our Wi-Fi for a while. So we were in the middle of something and everything shut down. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the other one is remembering the differences in time zones. Right. So many times people will say, I'm going to connect with you, I'm going to connect with you. They're talking about 9 o'clock their time, mm -hmm. but it's not until 10 o'clock your time or 11 o'clock, you know. So you have to be careful with that. Right. Well, thanks so much for the, the tips as well as the, the resources. Yes, time zones can be very, very tricky, especially global connections. Again, thanks so much for Billy and Paula for presenting today. I think everybody learned a lot about all different kinds of ways to connect globally. I'm now going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up. Well, we are definitely inspired, and I'm so glad we have all of those resources in our live binder because they went by fast, but they are fabulous. So be sure to check out the live binder later and explore them. We are excited for some more upcoming great sessions. And next Saturday, we're going to be hearing from a children's author, and her name is Diane de la Casas, and she's going to be sharing some of the literacy lessons she has learned as an artist in residence. And she has some great websites and things that you may uh, want to check out. We won't have a show on Memorial Day weekend. Um, but on June 3rd, we have Mark Moran coming back to join us. He's the creator of that fabulous search engine for kids called Sweet Search. And he's going to tell us all about how they are updating that. And he's also going to talk about the Choose to Matter project. Um, June 10th is still not quite finalized. June 17th will be our last webinar before our summer break. So we want all of you to plan to join us for that and come and get on the microphone and share what you have planned for your summer. What's on your summer bucket list? It can be personal or professional, anything at all that you're looking forward to doing this summer. And then we'll take a month off and we'll be back in August. So thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks, Peggy. There's a May virtual conference coming up, May 20th to 22nd. Uh, it's the 4T conference. And it looks like you can get a certificate of participation from this one, as well as uh, participating, of course, in the conference. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. 
He has gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session similar to this one. And as long as your session is public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site. There's also, of course, the tab in the live binder. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher. The video collections on iTunes U. As you exit the session, the survey link should open up. You can also take it, the link from the chat box or the chat log. It's also in the live binder. And once you complete the survey, you can also request a professional development certificate. It now prints out your name, thanks to Patty Ruffin. Uh, and make sure this gets sent to a personal email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guests, Paula Noggle, Billy Krakauer, and Jerry Blumengarten, Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today and shared resources. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>